Praise the Lord. Rise up to pray and prepare our hearts for the Bible study tonight. I want you to lift up your voice to the Lord and raise your heart to the Lord. That the Lord will open your eyes and give you the spirit of understanding. Enlighten your heart, quicken your spirit, and make you alive, awake, and alert as you come to the Bible study tonight. Pray that the Lord will give you the spirit of understanding and the promises of the word. The yes and amen in your life. And the warnings of the scripture. You'll take to heart. That you'll not be in church like nominal Christians. Church goers. You do not know why they are in church. But they make it a kind of regular practice because it's tradition for them. Pray that the Lord will give you a fresh view of the truthfulness of the word of God. That God will find in you a ready heart to learn. A heart devoted unto him. That he'll cut off from you. The spirit of nominalism. Tradition. That shallow, superficial spirit. That retains the word of God just on the surface. And then the birds of the air. The prince of the power of the air. The spirit that now works and the children of disobedience will then take that word out of their hearts because it's not planted and rooted deep in the heart. Pray that this word will so get deep into your heart will enrich your soul. Will dig up Everything that is hidden there, that is not of God. That the Lord will use the word as a surgical knife to cut off from you. Everything of the nature of fallen Adam. That God through his word will do a work of renewal, a work of regeneration. There will be a transformation, a change in your life, in your heart. And this word by which we are begotten, renewed, transformed, purged and purified, that the word will take root and effect in your life. That will be under the control of the dynamic, recreating, energizing, revitalizing spirit of God. And at this regenerating word, this transforming word, this recreating word will work effectually in your heart. As you hear, as you learn, as you believe, as you accept, as you hold on, holding fast to this word of life eternal. Pray that you come in week after week, studying week after week, will not be in vain, not be the heart like the soil by the wayside. Hearing the word, but not benefiting from the word. You know, be the heart like the stony ground. Not being able to bring fruit to perfection. That nothing of the world will be able to choke 
the word in your heart. In Jesus' name we pray. Did I hear your amen? Heavenly Father, we do thank you for every chance and every opportunity we have to gather before you. And we know that even though a man is standing in here to speak to your people, yet we know it's your spirit taking this word and making it alive and making it to work effectually in every heart. Lord, we pray once again that your great spirit, Holy Spirit, will be mightily present in our midst as we learn together in Jesus' name that this word will turn our lives around. We regenerate everyone, recreate everyone, transform everyone, and this word will work effectually in every heart in Jesus' name. That will shed light on your word in such a way you'll drive all doubt and all unbelief away from every heart in Jesus' name. We we'll pray that you keep us not only to be here as alone, to be doers of the word in Jesus' name. And then we go from hearing and doing, and then we become teachers and leaders in the vineyard of the Lord, taking the word of God and feeding the people that are hungry in our communities in Jesus' name. We thank you because we know you have answered. In Jesus' name we pray. Thank you very much. We are back to the Bible study today. And what a wonderful thing to come. In the very presence of the Lord. And allow the eternal word. The living word. Christ himself. To make the written word plain and clear to everyone. I pray that we'll allow this living word. To do a great work through his word in our lives in Jesus' name. When Daniel chapter 7, Daniel chapter 7, we're looking at it from verse 9. I beheld that the thrones were cast down, and the ancient of days did sit, whose garment was white as snow, and the air of his head like, like the pure wool. His throne was like the fairy flame, and his wheels as burning fire. A fairy stream issued and came forth from before him. Thousand thousands ministered unto him, and ten thousand times ten thousand stood before him, and the judgment was set, and the books were opened. I beheld then because of the voice of the great words which the horn spake. I beheld even till the beast was slain and his body destroyed and given to the burning flame. And concern, as concerning the rest of the beast, they had their dominion taken away. Yet their lives were prolonged for a season and time. I saw in the night visions, and behold, one like the Son of Man came with the clouds of heaven, and came to the Ancient of Days, and they brought him near before him, and there was given him dominion and glory and a kingdom that all people and nations and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away. And his kingdom with that which shall not be destroyed. As we look at the passage, it appears clear and appears very plain. At least it's clearer than all the other visions of those beasts and animals that Daniel had been relating unto us. It's talking about the ancient of days sitting on the judgment throne, the ancient of days on the judgment throne. This is a great revelation of prophetic truth. It is the supplement prophecy of God's authority as the judge, the judge of all the earth. And it's the revelation of the supreme royal, royal position of the Lord Jesus Christ, a Savior, and Lord, the Messiah. Daniel was God's prophet during the period of the Babylonian captivity. The Gentiles thought that they were so mighty and powerful. The despotic rulers and emperors thought they were independent of the God of heaven. That's why Nebuchadnezzar said, see, 
This is the great city Babylon that I have built by the majesty of my power. And then the voice had to come from heaven to convince him that it wasn't by his power. But you know all those emperors and kings and presidents and the captains of the people of the world. They think that their success, their accomplishment, their victory is by their own power. And he felt just like Nebuchadnezzar, just like Pharaoh, just like Aaron, just like the rest of them. That they were independent of the God of heaven. The wicked nations uh, thought that their kings and the old teammates and the final authority. In fact, if you look at Daniel chapter 5 verse 19, you'll see the kind of authority and the kind of power that Nebuchadnezzar wielded in his own day. At Daniel chapter 5 verse 19, and for the majesty that he gave him, all people, nations, and languages trembled and feared before him. Whom he would he slew, whom he would he kept alive, and whom he would he set up, and whom he would he put down. That's the kind of authority, finality, that those kings and priests and or presidents that they had in those days, they thought they were the ultimate, the final authority. But then, the kings and the princes of the gentle world, even though they position themselves as if they were unpunishable, untouchable. The prophecy here is revelation from heaven that God who created the earth and all the inhabitants therein has not abandoned the world to his creatures. He has not abandoned the ruling, the direction, the control, the judgment of the world unto his creatures. This revelation opposes the truth known to the patriarchs and the prophets from the earliest of times that God is the judge. Far back in Genesis, open your Bible, Genesis chapter 18, you'll find Abraham saying and repeating, pronouncing that God is the judge of the whole earth. We're looking at Genesis chapter 18, and we're looking at verse 25. They have the knowledge, as she ought to have the knowledge, as I have to have the knowledge, as all of us ought to have the knowledge that God is the ruler, is the controller, is the director, and is the judge of the whole earth. Genesis 18 verse 25, that be far from being to do after this manner to slay the righteous with the wicked, and the and the righteous as the that the righteous should be as the wicked that be far from thee listen to this now shall not the judge of the earth do right abraham knew that for back in genesis that god is the judge of the whole earth in first samuel chapter 2 first samuel chapter 2 we're looking at verse 10 in 1 Samuel chapter 2, verse 10, he has a revelation that Anna gave, and she, then she fell. Uh, sorry, uh, for Samuel chapter 2, I'm looking at verse 10. In verse 10 of 1 Samuel chapter 2. For Samuel chapter 2, verse 10, The adversaries of the Lord shall be broken to pieces out of heaven. Shall he thunder upon them? The Lord shall judge. Shall judge who? The ends of the earth. And he shall give strength unto his, unto his king and exalt the horn of his anointed. Therefore we learn that this God, the God of heaven, is the judge of all the earth. Abraham knew that, and Moses knew that, Joshua knew that. All those fathers of the tribes of Israel, they knew that. Anna knew that too, and the rest of the Israelites knew that. And we better know that God has not abandoned this world into the hands of a despot, of a tyrant, of an emperor, of a king, of anyone on, uh, or anyone on earth. He still holds the authority. And everybody confirms that God does judge. We're looking at Psalm 9, Psalm 9, verse 7 and verse 8. But the Lord shall endure forever. He has prepared his throne for judgment. He shall judge the world in righteousness. 
is the judge of the whole earth, is the judge of the ends of the earth, and is the judge of the whole world. It shall mean such judgment to the people in uprightness. In verse 16 and verse 17, the Lord is known by the judgment which he, which he executed. The wicked is sneered in the work of his own hand. Verse 17, the wicked shall be turned into where? The wicked shall be turned into hell, and all the nations that forget God. We're looking at Psalm 110. Psalm 110, verses 5 and 6. The Lord at the right hand shall strike through kings in the day of his wrath. He shall judge among the heathen. You know, there are people that think, well, I'm not a Christian. I don't think God is watching anything I'm doing. God is not taking note of anything I do because I don't go to church. I don't read the Bible. I don't believe any of those things. I'm just a pagan. I'm just a heathen. But the word of God says, the Lord shall judge among the heathen. I think Pharaoh thought that since he wasn't an Israelite, and I think Nebuchadnezzar thought since he wasn't a Jew, I think Herod thought since I'm not an Israelite, God's hand is too short, cannot reach me where I am. But the word of God says he shall judge among the heathen. We're looking at Isaiah chapter 2 and verse 4. Isaiah chapter 2, reading there in verse 4, and he shall judge among the nations, not just one nation, not just Israel, not just the Jews, not just the Hebrews, he shall judge among the nations and shall rebuke many people, and he shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nations shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war anymore in Joel chapter 3. Joel chapter 3 coming near to the end of the Old Testament. This was still the confirmation of those prophets of old telling us and reminding us that God is judge and he judges the heathens. He judges the pagans. He judges the nations. He judges the whole earth. He judges the whole world. In Joel chapter 3 verse 12 let the heathen be wicked and come up to the valley of Jehoshaphat. For there will I seek to judge all the heathen round about. All the heathen. That means the judgment of the whole world, Gentiles and Jews, the righteous and the unrighteous, the sinner and the sage, the unbeliever and the believer, the one that says there's God, the one that says there's no God, the judgment of everyone is in the hand of the Almighty God. You say those are Old Testament, Old Testament passages. You are right. Now the New Testament, Hebrews chapter, Hebrews chapter nine. I'm reading from verse twenty-seven. Hebrews chapter nine. We're looking at verse twenty-seven, reminding us that God is judge. Hebrews chapter 9, verse 27. And as it is appointed unto men wants to die, but after this the judgment. The New Testament confirms what we've been reading from Genesis all through to the end of the Old Testament that God is the judge of the whole earth. As it is appointed unto men wants to die, after this, the judgment. Acts of the Apostles, chapter 17. In Acts of the Apostles, chapter 17, verses 30 and 31. Acts, chapter 17, verses 30 and 31. Yeah, it tells us, And at times of this ignorance, God winked at, but now commandeth how many men? Tell me out loud. God wants all men to repent. And if somebody is not repenting, that's a sin by itself. Because you are disobeying the express commandment of the Lord. He has commanded all men to repent. The moment you hear the word of God, you drop the evil things and the sinful things in your hand. You say, Lord, I've heard, I've had your commandment to repent. I'm repenting. If you don't, you are contradicting him. You are resisting him. And that's a sin by itself. He has now commanded all men to repent. And then it says, because in verse 31, he has appointed it 
day in the which he will judge the world in righteousness by that man whom he has ordained, whereof he has given assurance unto all men in that he has raised him from the dead. We're looking at Romans chapter 1. Romans chapter 1, I'm reading from verse 17. In Romans chapter 1 verse 17, the word of God makes it very clear what kind of judgment will come. And who will have the judgment, whether it's only the people that do the evil or those who encourage them. Those who support them, those who assist them, or those who instigate them. The word of God makes us to understand the sinners will be judged. Not only that, the people that teach and train and encourage the sinners and drive the sinners to sin, the two will be judged. I'm reading from Romans chapter 1, I'm reading from verse 17. Romans chapter 1, verse 17. It says, for therein is the righteousness of God revealed from face to faith, as it is written, the just shall live by faith. That means, uh, if you want to escape the judgment of God and have life eternal, you turn away from sin, you abandon your evil, you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and you express that faith and trust and confidence in the Lord. He died for me. He took away my sin. He's my substitute. He's my savior. By the blood of Jesus Christ, he cleanses us from all condemnation and guilt. And then you come to life eternal. And then you continue to live now in the righteousness of God by faith. But now if you don't do that, the sinners will remain in sin. Verse 18. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold truth in unrighteousness. They have heard the truth. They hold that truth in unrighteousness. They have learned the truth. They have studied the truth. The truth of repentance, of righteousness, of reconciliation with God, of regeneration, of how we can return from the way of sin and come to the Lord. And they hold that truth in unrighteousness. And the word of God says, the judgment will come upon such people. In fact, it says that those people that hold that truth in right in unrighteousness, there's something peculiar about them. They do not like to retain the knowledge of God in them. When the true knowledge of God comes, that will convict them of sin and that will make them to turn away from sin, they hate that. They reject that. And that's why the word of God says in verse 28, I'm going to Romans chapter 1 verse 28, even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a reprobate mind to do those things which are not convenient, being filled with all unrighteousness. And here is the reason why God is going to judge them now. Here is what they are holding on to, they are not repenting from. Here is what they so love and embrace that they don't want to obey the commandments of God. Here is what they love so much and they hate the word and the will of God. It says in verse 29, being filled with all unrighteousness. Then he begins to name them fornication, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, full of envy, murder, debate, deceit, malignity, whisperers, backbiters, and haters of God, despiteful and proud and boasters, inventors of evil things, disobedient to parents, without understanding, covenant breakers, without natural affection, implacable, unmerciful. Was the result? Was the end of that in verse 22? Who knowing the judgment of God, the Old Testament says God is judge. The New Testament says God is judge. And that everybody ought to know that God will judge all the deeds of man at the end of his life. And then will determine his eternal destiny. And it says that these people that hold the truth and righteousness, it is not that they are ignorant of the judgment of God. They just deliberately close their minds and their hearts and their, and their, and their will to the truth. That's why it says, who knowing the judgment of God, that they which commit such things are worthy of death, not only do the same, but do what? 
Tell me out loud. Tell me once again. There are pleasure in them that do them. That means then, it's not only the people that just sin by themselves, but those who have pleasure in the sinners. Those who have some kind of gain, some kind of profit, some kind of glee, joy, happiness in the people that are committing sin. And they encourage them and they influence them and they instigate them and they push them on. They say, that's right, do it. The people that have pleasure in them that do evil, they are also judged. God is still the final authority in heaven and on the earth at the present time as well as in time in the eternal future. I- I- individual sinners and sinful nations will not go unpunished. The mightiest of men and the greatest of nations will not escape God's judgment. Even those who tolerate and encourage and delight in evil doers will not escape the judgment of God. I pray they will escape in Jesus' name. Give me a good, good amen. amen. We're looking at Daniel chapter 7, and we're studying this under three subtitles. Number one, the description and the power of the eternal king. The description and the power of the eternal king. Number two, the damnation of the prince of earthly kingdoms. The prince of earthly kingdoms, the damnation that will come. The peril that will come, the perdition that will come, the eternal suffering that will come upon that prince of the earthly kingdoms. Number three, the dominion and the permanence of the everlasting king. The dominion and the permanence of the everlasting king. Number one, the description and the power of the eternal king. We're coming back to Daniel chapter 7 verse 9. I beheld that the thrones were cast down. The thrones were cast down. What does that mean? Those uh, kings of the earth, the emperors of the world, of those great world empires, when they ruled and reigned, they had their thrones. The Babylonian Empire, the Middle Persian Empire, the Grecian Empire, the Roman Empire, all that Daniel had seen in the vision. They had their thrones, and those thrones were eventually cast down, thrown away, and destroyed. And now it says, and the ancient of days did siege. That's the Almighty God. The ancient of days, he did see it, whose garment was white as snow, and the air of his head like the pure wool. And then it says, his throne, you see that? His throne. The ancient of days, yes, his own throne, pure, white, great, higher, majestic, and fearful, and fierce. He had a throne, and then it says that he sat on his throne. His throne was like a fiery flame, the fiery flame, and his wheels as burning fire, and a fair stream. It says issued and came from before him. Thousand thousands ministered unto him, and ten thousand and ten thousand said uh, they stood before him, and the judgment was set, and the books were opened. That's talking about the Lord. And you'll see that in this uh, passage of Daniel chapter 7, in verse 13, we meet the ancient of this again. And then in verse, uh, in verse uh, 22, we meet the ancient of this again. Look at verse 13. In verse 13, it tells us about the ancient of this once again. I saw in, in the night visions, and behold one like the Son of Man. Who is that? I said, who is that? Like the Son of Man, as Jesus Christ came with the clouds of heaven and came to the ancient of days. That is, he came to God the Father. He came to God the judge of the whole earth. And then it says, and they brought him. That him is referring to the Son of God, the Son of Man. That is Jesus Christ, our Lord, our Savior, our Redeemer. The one that has saved us and washed us and then he has redeemed us, taking us away from the eternal judgment that will come. Because of that, he now came before him. That is, he came before the ancient 
ancient of days. Look at verse 22. Until the ancient of days came. And judgment was given to the saints of the Most High. That ancient of days, the eternal God, the everlasting King, he is called there the Most High. And the time came that the saints possessed the kingdom. I pray you'll be among the saints that will possess the kingdom in Jesus' name. The time of solemn judgment had come. Thrones, the thrones of the beastly kings had been overthrown and destroyed. Now God's throne of glory and splendor, and God's throne of justice and judgment, and God's throne of irresistible power and overpowering authority was set. God, the ancient of days, the great judge, had come forth in his majesty, glory, and dazzling, dazzling purity to judge and to bring the power and the pride of beastly kingdoms and brutal kings and bestial men to an end. Three times in this chapter, that is in chapter 7 of Daniel, I've read that already, in verse 9, verse 13, and verse 22, the God of heaven is referred to as the ancient of days. He is the eternal uncreated self-existent one without beginning of days nor end of life. Days God the eternal is from everlasting to everlasting and his years have no end. Let's look at Psalm 90 verse 2. Psalm 90 verse 2. Describing for us the eternal God, the everlasting King, the God of heaven and earth, the judge of the whole earth, the ancient of days. In Psalm 90 verse 2. Before the mountains were brought forth, or ever thou hast formed the earth and the world, even from everlasting to everlasting, thou art God. That's why referred to is referred to as the ancient of days, is being God from all eternity, and it'll be God until all eternity. In Psalm 102, Psalm 102, verse 24, Psalm 102, verse 24, I said, O my God, take me not away in the midst of my days, that years are throughout all generations. That's why it's referred to as ancient of days, that years, referring to the Almighty God, that years are throughout all generations of old, as thou laid the foundation of the earth, and the heavens are the work of thy hands. They shall all perish, they'll come to their end, but thou shalt endure. Ye, all of them shall wax old like a garment, as a vesture shall thou change them, and they shall be changed. How about God? Verse 27, but thou art the same, and thy years shall have no end. It remains ever the same from everlasting to everlasting. We're looking at Psalm 104 verses 1 and 2. Psalm 104 verses 1 and 2. Bless the Lord of my soul. O oh, oh my, oh Lord, my God, thou art very great, thou art close with honor and majesty, who covereth thyself with light as with a garment, who stretchest out the heavens like a Cutting is referring to what Daniel has just told us about the gamut of this ancient of days, this almighty God. Come back to that and refresh and remind yourself of what Daniel had said about the ancient of days, about the everlasting God. In Daniel chapter 7, Daniel chapter 7, I'm reading verse 9 again. I beheld the thrones were cast down, and the ancient of days did sit, whose garment was white as snow. Whose garment was white as snow. Reminding us that this almighty God that is the ancient of days and he is from everlasting and his garment is so pure and that, that shows his purity, that shows his majesty. And then he goes on to say, and the air of his head was like pure wool, very white. That's talking about his eternal age. It's uh, the very fact that he has, he has perfection of wisdom and the purity of his declaration. 
generation because it says its throne is also like fairy flame. This judgment will strike the strongest of tyrants with fear and trembling as he will discover what he has never considered that our God is a consuming fire. I pray that as the people of the world will discover it when it is too late, when it cannot repent, you will not discover it too late. You'll know it now. You'll walk on it and stand on it and pray about it. And then you make reconciliation with God even at this time in Jesus' name. Still talking about the majesty and the glory and the dominion of the almighty God, the ancient of days. We're looking at First Timothy chapter 6. First Timothy chapter 6, verses 15 and 16. First Timothy chapter 6, verse 15. Which is, which in his time he shall show, who is the blessed and only potentate, the King of kings and the Lord of lords, who only has immortality, dwelling in the light which no man can approach unto dwelling in the light which no man can approach unto. And then it goes on to say, whom no man has seen or can see, to whom be honor and power everlasting. And everybody said, Amen. Amen. That's talking about the Almighty God. Let's turn to Psalm 9, Psalm 50, verses 3 and 4. Psalm 50, verses 3 and 4. We're looking at the majesty of our God, the glory of our God, and the greatness of our God, and the fierce judgment of this Almighty God. In Psalm, 1, in Psalm 50, verses 3 and 4, our God shall come. And shall not keep silence. A fire shall devour before him, and it shall be ter- it shall be tempestuous round about him. Verse four: He shall call to the heavens from above and to the earth that he may judge his people. He will judge his people. And then Psalm ninety-seven. Psalm ninety-seven. Verses. 2 and 3. Psalm 97, verse 2. Clouds and darkness are round about him. Righteousness and judgment at the habitation of his throne. A fire goes before him and burneth up his enemies round about. It talks about the judgment that will come upon the unbeliever, upon the sinner. Upon the one who refuses to repent, who delights in sin, rejoices and delights in evil. In Isaiah chapter 66, Isaiah 66 verse 15. For behold, the Lord will come with fire and with his chariots like a whirlwind to render his anger with fury and his rebuke with flames of fire. Can you see how many scriptures are telling us of the judgment and the fair indignation and the wrath and the suffering that will come upon the unrepentant sinners, the unsaved people, the people that live in sin and abide in evil, and the people that reject the opportunity to repent, and the people that reject the salvation that Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, has bought and purchased for us, the people that re- refuse the free grace of God, the judgment and the wrath, the perdition, the peril, the damnation, the doom that will come upon them. Tells us in that verse 15, look at it again, for behold, the Lord will come with fire. And with his chariots like, his, like a whirlwind to render his anger, his wrath, his indignation with fury and his rebuke of flames of fire. For by fire and by his sword will the Lord plead with all flesh and the slain of the Lord shall be many. I will not be among those people. I said I will not be among those people. 
if you repent and you give your life to the Lord, that's how you escape the judgment of God. And you say, no, I don't want to be there. And the Lord will protect us from that eternal everlasting judgment in Jesus' name. We're looking at Hebrews chapter 12. Hebrews chapter 12, we're looking at verse, we're looking at verse 29. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 29. Hebrews 12, verse 29. For our God is, tell me out loud, a consuming fire. You know there are people that only talk about the love of God, about the grace of God. About the goodness of God, about the compassion of God. That's one side of the story. Yes, there's mercy for those who repent. Yes, there's love for those who believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. The people that run away from their sin and they embrace the righteousness that Christ has purchased for us. There's mercy and love, compassion and goodness. But there is wrath. Judgment, indignation, fury against the people that abide and remain in sin. For our God is a consuming fire. Revelation chapter 6. Revelation chapter 6. I'm reading from verse 15. Revelation chapter 6. We're looking at verse 15. Revelation chapter 6 verse 15. And the kings of the earth. And the great men, and the rich men, and the chief captains, and the mighty men, and every bondman, and every free man hid themselves in the dens, in the, on the rocks of the mountains. And they said to the mountains and to the rocks, Fall on us, and hide us from the face of him that seated on the throne, and from the rocks of the Lamb, for the great day of what? Of his love, tell me out loud, of his wrath, judgment, indignation, fury, for the great day of his wrath has come, and who shall be able to abide? Let's come back to Daniel chapter 7, something very important here, we mustn't pass by and overlook. In Daniel chapter 7, we're looking at verse 10, Daniel chapter 7, looking at verse 10. A first tree issued and came forth from before him. Thousand thousands ministered unto him. And ten thousand and ten thousand stood before him. And the judgment was set. Read the last part of that sentence. Again. Can you read that confidently? And the books were opened. You better understand that everything we do here on earth is recorded now. It's a book of records. God will not just judge arbitrarily when we get over there. The sinners, the unbelievers, the unrighteous, and the people, the evildoers, Everything that is done by every individual, everything is recorded on the small and the great, the men and the women, the boys and the girls, the youths and the adults. Everything is recorded on by the Almighty God. And that's why it says, and the books were opened. The books are going to be opened in the day of judgment. Let's come to Revelation chapter 20. Revelation chapter 20, I'm reading from verse 12. Revelation chapter 20, verse 12. And I saw the dead, small and great. I saw the dead, small and great. You know, there are some people that feel, that say, oh, I'm still young, I'm still a youth, I'm still a teenager, I'm still a little boy, a little girl. I understand. If my parents are living righteous, that one I understand. But about me, I'm still going to do all the things I want to do. When I get older... When I become an adult, then I will do right. Do you understand that even though you are young, all those evil things you do and the sinful things you practice, they are written down. And except you come to the Lord Jesus Christ and you trust in the blood, the atoning blood of Christ, to wash everything away, to wipe everything away, the record will remain there. That's why it says in Revelation chapter 20 verse 12, it says, And I saw the dead, small and great, Stand before God. And the books were open. 
They are small, they are great, they are young, they are old, they are youths, they are teenagers, they are adults, and the records of their lives are kept. And it says the books were opened, and another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged out of those things which are written in the books according to their works. We cannot hide from God everything that is done in the secret, in the public. Everything is known by God and recorded down except to allow the blood of Jesus to cleanse them and wash everything away. Hebrews chapter 4 verse 13. Hebrews chapter 4. I'm looking at verse 13. Neither is there any creature that is not manifest in his sight. Neither is there any creature young and old, youths and adults, boys and girls, men and women, singles and married. Neither is there any creature that is not manifest in his sight. But all things are naked and open unto the eyes of him with whom we have have to do. Kings normally keep books of records, and the king of heaven, the God of heaven, also keeps the books of records. Esther chapter 6. In Esther chapter 6, we're looking at an example of keeping a book of records. Those kings did it. And they follow after the example of the Almighty God Himself. He has a book of records. Esther chapter 6, verses 1 and 2. On that night, could not the king sleep? And he commanded to bring what? The book of records. He commanded them to bring the book of records of the chronicles. And they were read before the king. And it was found reaching that Mordecai had told of Bigdatha, Bigdana, and Teresh, who two of the king's chamberlains, the keepers of the door, who sought to lay hands on the king, Ahasuerus. It says the records were kept, and the kings of the earth, if they kept such records, do you know that the Almighty God too keeps his own records? And on the final day of judgment, when the ancient of days, when the Almighty God, when the Most High, when the God of the Judge of all the earth, when he'll bring everyone, young and old, he'll bring them one by one before him and judge them on that day, he will open the books of records and men and women will be judged out of those things that were reaching therein after we are born again we become children of God and now we begin to live lives of righteousness of holiness and lives of purity and lives of usefulness in the kingdom of God every good thing that we do every good thing is also written down the good deeds that we do the good words that you speak the evangelism that you do the souls you bring it to the kingdom the faithfulness the sacrifice the consecration every good thing that you do is also kept in record and it's written in the book of remembrance as well malachi now malachi chapter 3 i'm reading from verse 16 malachi chapter 3 and we're reading from verse 16. Then they that feared the Lord speak often one to another. And the Lord hearkened and heard it. And a book of what? A book of remembrance. A book of remembrance. God remembers every good deed that you do. Every good word that you speak. Every good sacrifice that you make. Every commendable consecration that you make. And every work of evangelism that you do. And every deed of bringing a soul into the kingdom. God remembers everything and he writes a book of remembrance. And it says a book of remembrance was reaching before him for them that feared the Lord and that thought upon his name and they shall be mine says the Lord of hosts in that day when I make up my jewels and I will spare them as a man spareth his own son that serveth him and they then shall ye return and discern between the righteous and the wicked between him that serveth God and him that serveth him not. I pray you'll be among those who are serving the Lord faithfully and a, and a book of remembrance will be written concerning you in Jesus name. I need a good amen there. Amen. We're looking at now point number two. Point number two Daniel chapter 7 verses 
11 and 12. Daniel chapter 7 verses 11 and 12. I beheld then, because of the voice of the great words which the horn spake, I beheld even till the beast was slain and his body destroyed and given to the burning flame. I want you to remember we studied about those beasts last week. The beasts represented the kings of the Gentile kingdoms. The first one, the Babylonian emperor, represent, represented by the beast, the lion. And then the second one, the Middle Persian emperor, that is uh, represented by the bear, or the leopard, and then the, other, the, the, the bear, and then the next one, the Grecian emperor. Alexander the Great, represented by the leopard. And the last one, the one that was diverse from all the others, and his look was terrific and terrifying, representing the Roman emperor. And it says now the final one, the one that has the little horn, the one speaking blasphemy against the almighty God, which is actually standing for the Antichrist. I told you last week there are three A's. Number one is Alexander the Great. Number two is the Antichrist. Antiochus, the Greek, that is Antiochus Epiphanes, and then number three, the Antichrist, the one that will come in the revived Roman Empire, that will come on the final day when the church had been raptured away, and then during that time of the great tribulation, that Antichrist will come up, and then he will speak blasphemous things against the Lord Almighty, and now it says judgment will come. And the judgment is not only on the small and the great, on the kings and the princes, on the counselors and the captains and the people of the world. It's also upon this one represented by the horn, representing the Antichrist. The judgment will also come. Let me just remind you about this Antichrist and about his characteristic and about the blaspheme, about the things that he will say against the Almighty God and the judgment that will come upon him. I'm looking at that same chapter 7 verse 25. Chapter 7 verse 25. And he shall speak great words against the Most High and shall wear out the saints of the Most High and think to change times and laws. And they shall be given unto his hand until a time and times and the dividing of time. If you look at the last part of that verse, time, that's one year, times, two years, that's one year plus two years, that's three, and the dividing of time, that's half a year, three and a half years. The time of the great tribulation will be three and a half years, and this king or prince of fierce countenance will say and speak blasphemous words against the Lord Almighty, his judgment will come at last. Look at verse 26, and the judgment shall see it, and they shall take away his dominion, and consume, and consume, and destroy unto the end. That's the Antichrist, eventually is going to be destroyed and taken away from the seat of his blasphemous throne. We're looking at chapter 8, verse 25. Chapter 8, verse 25, talking about this beast that the Almighty will come and destroy by the mighty powerful judgment against the Antichrist in the last days. Daniel chapter 8, verse 20, 25. It says, and through his policy, the policy of that Antichrist at the time of the great tribulation, through his policy, also shall he cause craft, deceit, falsehood to prosper in his hand, and he shall magnify himself in his heart, and by peace shall he destroy many. He shall also stand up against the prince of princes. He will stand up against Christ. That's why it's the Antichrist. He stands in opposition against Christ. He will stand against the prince of princes, but he shall be what? broken without hands he'll be destroyed the mighty power of god will destroy him daniel chapter 11 verse 45 the antichrist the judgment that will come upon him 
the destruction, devastation that will come upon that Antichrist. Daniel chapter 11 verse 45. And he shall plant the tabernacles of his palace between the seas in the glorious mountain. Yet he shall come to his end. The Antichrist will come to his end. That beast will come to his end. That blasphemous prince of the revived Roman Empire in the last days will come to his end. And none shall help him. And we're looking at uh, Revelation chapter 19 verse 20. Revelation chapter 19 verse 20. Referring to the judgment that will come upon the Antichrist. Upon the beast. Upon the one that has the horn, horn representing strength, his power, that he feels so great, so courageous, and so bold, that he blasphemes the Lord God Almighty. Revelation chapter 19 verse 20, and the beast was taken, and with him the false prophet that wrought miracles before him. With which he deceived them that had received the mark of the beast, and them that worshipped the image, these were both cast alive into what? Into a lake of fire, burning with brimstone. And when they get into that lake of fire, will they ever come out? Will they die there? Will they be burnt up there? They'll be there forever and ever. Look at that in Revelation chapter 14. Revelation chapter 14 verse 10. The same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture into the cup of his indignation. That's the cup of judgment and the cup of his wrath. The judgment of God, the fiery indignation of God poured out into this indignation, cup of indignation. And it shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. And the smoke of their torment ascendeth up, how long? Forever and ever. I will not be there. I said I will not be there. You know, if you repent and turn to the Lord, if you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you take him as your personal savior, you accept the blood, the atoning blood that he shed for you on the cross of Calvary, and then you are cleansed, you are poured, you are made righteous, and then you transfer your sins to Christ, and he transfers all his righteousness unto you. And then you live in that righteousness in the sight of the Lord day and night, Helped by the grace of God. That's how, how you escape the judgment of God. And that's how you will not be there with them in Jesus' name. It says, and the smoke of their torment ascends up forever and ever. And they have no rest day nor night to worship the beast and his image. Whosoever receiveth the mark of his name and it's not just the antichrist alone it's not just the the beast alone all those who follow the antichrist all those who are opposed to the will of god the word of god the commandments of the lord all those who rebel against the word of the lord did you there'll be part of the people that are going to be judged and they'll be thrown into that same lake of fire. What a terrible thing will happen to those people. Then they will regret and say, had I known, I would have repented and called upon the Lord when the chance was there for me. Revelation chapter 20, I'm reading from verse 11. Revelation chapter 20, verse 11. It says, and I saw a great white throne, and him that sat on each, from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away, and there was and there was found no place for them. And I saw the dead, small and great stand before God, and the books were opened, and another book was opened, which is the book of life, and the dead were judged out of those things which were reaching. And the dead were judged out of those things which were reaching. The dead of all generations from the creation from the time of the creation of adam until the very last man 
from the beginning of the world, from generation to generation, until the end of the world, in all nations and tongues and languages, among all people, the dead, they were judged out of those things which were written. And then it says, out of the books, according to their words. And then in verse, in verse 13, and the sea gave up the dead which were in it. And death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them. And they were judged. How many people? Every man. Every man. Every man. According to their works. And death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. And whosoever. Whosoever was not found reaching in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. That's why Jesus says, rejoice because your names are written in heaven. It's only those who have their names in the book of life by repentance and faith in Christ. By righteousness and holiness before the Lord. By grace and godliness. Only those who have their names in the book of life. And the names are kept there. They don't backslide. They don't turn away from the Lord. Those are the people that will escape the lake of fire. The torment of hell forever and ever. And I pray that you will escape in Jesus name. And let's, let's come back to this Daniel again. Daniel chapter 7. I need to show you something there. Daniel chapter 7. And let us see the, uh, the, the, the word there you must not overlook. The word is because, because, very important word. Anything God does, he has a purpose, he has a reason. He did this because, and we need to follow through on that. Look at, uh, look at Daniel chapter 7. In Daniel chapter 7, Daniel chapter 7, we're looking at uh, this, verse 11. Daniel chapter 7, verse 11. And it says, I beheld then, what's the next word? Tell me out loud. Because of the voice of the great words which the horns speak. That's why the judgment came. Because of those words which the horns speak, I beheld till the beast was slain and his body destroyed and given to the burning flame. Because, because, because. You see, when we speak words against the Almighty God, great swelling words of vanity. Those words bring judgment. Look at Daniel chapter 11, verse 36. Daniel 11, verse 36. Remember that because, because of those words that were spoken, that's why the judgment came. In chapter 11, verse 36, and the king shall do according to his will, and he shall exalt himself and magnify himself above every god, and shall speak marvelous things against the god of gods, and shall prosper till the indignation shall be accomplished. Indignation shall come, wrath shall come, perdition, judgment shall come, the wrath of God shall come because of those words, for that that is determined shall be done. Revelation chapter 13, I'm reading verses 5 and 6. Revelation 13, verses 5 and 6. Remember that because, because, because of those words that were spoken. That's why the judgment will come. Revelation chapter 13, verse 5. And there was given unto him a mouth speaking great things and blasphemies. And power was given unto him to continue forty and two months. That is three and a half years right there. And he opened his mouth in blasphemy against God to blaspheme his name and his tabernacle and them that dwell in heaven. And it's for that reason, because of that, that's why the judgment will come. Do you learn a lesson from that? That if you too speak words of vanity, words of blasphemy, words that are destructive against God, against Christ, against the servants of the Lord, against the saints of God, against the believers, against the church of the living God, because of 
those words that are spoken in secret or in the public, the wrath of God and the judgment of God will come. In Second Peter chapter two, I'm reading from verse twelve. Second Peter chapter two, verse twelve. But these as natural brute beasts made to be taken and destroyed speak evil of the things that they understand not and shall utterly perish in their own corruption. It's talking about human beings now, the people that act like the Antichrist. And they have the mouth of the Antichrist because they have the spirit of the Antichrist. There is the spirit of the Antichrist. And it is that spirit of the Antichrist that most people to act and to live and to speak and to think and to behave like the Antichrist. And if you have the spirit of the Antichrist and the mouth of the Antichrist that says such an individual will be judged. I'm reading Jude verse 8. Jude verse 8. Likewise also, these filthy dreamers defile the flesh, despise dominion, and speak evil of dignities. These are human beings now, but these are the people that have the spirit of the Antichrist and the mouth of the Antichrist. And they speak great swelling words. Abusive words, insultive words, derogatory words, belittling words, blasphemous words against Christ and the servants of Christ and the saints in Christ. Look at verse 10. But these speak evil of those things which they know not, but they that what they know naturally as brute beasts in those things they corrupt themselves. Jump down to verse 14. Enoch also the servant from Adam prophesied of these, saying, Behold, the Lord cometh with ten thousands of his saints to execute judgment upon all and to convince all that are ungodly among them of all the ungodly deeds which ungodly men have committed and of all their hard speeches which ungodly sinners have spoken which ungodly sinners, the people that have the mouth of the Antichrist and the spirit of the Antichrist. And you can tell when somebody is talking, when he's speaking against God, against Christ, against his dominion, against his kingdom, or against the servants of God, or against the children of God. And you know that that's the mouth of an antichrist. And it says judgment will come. In verse 16, these are murmurers, complainers, walking after their own laws. Their mouth speaketh great swelling words, having immense persons in admiration because of advantage. I pray God will transform our hearts and God will change our language. So that all those corrupt words, defiling words, destructive words, polluting words, and all those words of blasphemy, all those words of righteousness will be cleansed away from our mouths in Jesus' name. And then we'll be able to escape the judgment that comes upon the people that use the mouth of the Antichrist and motivated and engineered by the spirit of the Antichrist. We'll come to point number three now. The dominion and the permanence of the everlasting king. The dominion and the permanence of the everlasting king. We're coming back to Daniel chapter 7. Daniel chapter 7. I'm reading from verse 13. I saw in the night visions, and behold, one like the Son of Man. He came with the clouds of heaven, and came to the Ancient of Days, and they brought him near before him. Here is the Son of Man. This is the Lord Jesus Christ. He came to the Ancient of Days. He came to God the Father. 
And God the Father is to give him now the kingdom, the dominion. And we're told in verse 14, And there was given him dominion and glory and a kingdom that all people, nations, and languages shall serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away. And his kingdom that which shall not be destroyed. Now you see here it mentions the son of man. Let me remind you of that in verse 13. I saw in the night visions. And behold, one like the son of man came with the clouds of heaven. What's this referring to? This is referring to the second coming of Christ. When Christ came the first time, he didn't come with the clouds of heaven. He was born in a manger. But he's coming again. And when he comes again, he'll be coming with the clouds of heaven. And you know that every time the Lord Jesus referred to himself as the son of man, most of the times he connected that with his coming again. Let me show you Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Let's look at Matthew. In Matthew chapter 13. You see the connection between the Son of Man and the second coming of Christ. Christ is that Son of Man. And he talks about his coming again. And he gives himself the title of the Son of Man. According to what we've read already in Daniel chapter 7 verse 13. Look at this now in Matthew chapter 13 verses 40 and 41. The Son of Man shall send forth his angels and shall gather out of his kingdom all things that offend and them that do iniquity and shall cast them into a furnace of fire and there shall be wailing and gnashing of teeth. That's about the second coming of Christ and he refers to himself as the Son of Man. Matthew chapter 16 verse 27. Matthew 16 verse 27. For the Son of Man shall come in the glory of his father with his angels and then shall he reward every man according to his works you see that the son of man coming the second time and then in chapter 24 chapter 24 verse 27 matthew chapter 24 verse 27 for as the lightning cometh out of the east and shineth even to the west, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. He's talking about his coming, second coming. And he refers to himself as the Son of Man. Chapter 26, Matthew 26, verse 64. Jesus saith unto him, Thou hast said, Nevertheless, I say unto you, hereafter shall ye see the Son of Man sitting on the right hand of power and coming in the clouds of heaven. That tells you that's what Daniel was referring to. It's coming again, and when he comes again, it'll be coming with the clouds of heaven. In Matthew chapter 25, verse 31, verse 32. Matthew chapter 25, verse 31. When the Son of Man shall come in his glory. Second coming of Christ, the Son of Man shall come with the clouds of heaven. Daniel saw that ahead of time. Have you seen the, the length of time, the visions of Daniel covers from the time of Babylon to that of Middle Persia to that of Greece and to that of Rome and into the time of the Antichrist and into the time of the second coming of Christ and then to the time of the establishment of the millennial reign. The visions of Daniel cover a lot of time. It's a, a wide span of time when the Son of Man shall come in his glory. And all the holy angels with him then shall he sit upon the, upon the throne of his glory. And before him shall be gathered all nations and he shall separate them one from another as a shepherd divideth a sheep from the goats. We're looking at Mark chapter 13. Mark chapter 13, I'm reading verse 26. Mark 13, verse 26. And then shall they see the Son of Man coming in the clouds with great power and glory. And Matthew and Mark, they're writing about what Daniel had said. He saw in the vision. The Son of Man coming with the clouds of heaven and coming to the ancient of 
this. Luke chapter 12. In Luke chapter 12, I'm reading from verse 40. Luke chapter 12, verse 40. Be ye therefore ready also, for the Son of Man cometh at an hour when ye think not. Chapter 21 of Luke. Luke chapter 21. Reading from verse 36. Watch ye therefore, and pray always that she may be accounted worthy to escape all these things that shall come to pass and to stand before the Son of Man. Do you see how accurate the prophecy of Daniel was that he wrote about the Son of Man coming to the ancient of days at the time of the second coming of Christ? And now Matthew has confirmed that, and Mark has confirmed that, and Luke has confirmed that, and now John chapter 5, verse 27. John chapter 5, verse 27, and has given him authority to execute judgment also because he is a son of man. And so you find as uh, those words, son of man of course in Daniel is referring to Jesus Christ who is the son of man. And then his coming is coming again. And when he comes, he comes to reign and he will reign over the whole world, the whole universe. Christ the Messiah. Christ our Lord. Christ our Savior. Christ the son of God, the son of man, the son of David, the son of Abraham. This Christ was a sacrifice Sacrifice his life so that we can be saved. It's going to be Lord and King. And then the word of God affirms that he came to the ancient of days. And when he came, you know, God, he received the kingdom. And it's going to have a universal, perpetual kingdom. We're coming back to Daniel now. Daniel chapter 7. We're going to look at the length of his kingdom, the authority of this king, the power of this king. Daniel chapter 7 verse 14. And there was given unto him, given unto Christ, given unto the Messiah, given unto our Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of Man. And there was given unto him dominion and glory and a kingdom that all people, nations and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion. Praise the Lord. Which shall not pass away. And his kingdom that which shall not be destroyed. Christ is coming. And when he comes, this kingdom, the kingdom that, that he will have, will be an everlasting kingdom. Let's look at Isaiah chapter 9. Isaiah chapter 9, we're reading verses 6 and 7. Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6. For unto us a child is born. Unto us a son is given. And the kingdom and the government shall be upon his shoulder. That means that Jesus Christ will come. He will reign. He will reign forever and ever. Because his dominion, his kingdom will be from generation to generation. And his kingdom will be forever. His name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. Can I explain something to you? Here it says, the everlasting father. You know what that means? The father of eternity. That doesn't mean it's God the father. No, it's God the son. The almighty God, the most high, the ancient of days, is God the father. And we cannot call Jesus the father. But he's the everlasting father in the sense that he's the father of eternity. Is a father of time and eternity. So don't say Jesus is father, Jesus is son, Jesus is the Holy Ghost. No, the Lord Almighty, the ancient of days, he is a father. And Jesus Christ, he is a son and he is the prince of peace. In verse 7, and of the increase of his kingdom and the peace, there shall be no end upon the throne of David and upon his kingdom to order it and to establish it with judgment and with justice from henceforth even forever. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. It will be done in Jesus' name. Some two. Let's hear the Father now, the Almighty God Himself, talking concerning the Son and concerning the kingdom that He will have, which will be forever His dominion, His kingdom forever and ever. Some two. I'm reading from verse six. Yet have I said, My King, 
upon my holy hill of Zion. I will declare the decree. The Lord has said unto me, Thou art my son. That's the son of God. Thou art my son. It says, This day have I begotten thee, ask of me, and I shall give thee the heathen for thine inheritance, and the uttermost parts of the earth for thy possession. And then it says in verse 9, Thou shalt break them with a rod of iron, and thou shalt dash them in pieces like a potter's vessel, talking about how God, how Christ will reign forever and ever. And we're looking at uh, Philippians chapter 2. Philippians chapter 2, reading from verse 9. Philippians chapter 2, verse 9. Philippians chapter 2, verse 9. Wherefore God has also highly exalted him. And giving him a name that's above every name. The name of Jesus is above every other name. Above Nebuchadnezzar, above Herod, above Belshazzar, above Cyrus, above Darius, above everyone. is king of kings and his lord of lords. Wherefore God also has highly exalted him. And giving him a name which is above every name. That at the name of Jesus every knee should bow. Of things in heaven and things in earth and things under the earth. And that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. To the glory of God the Father. Jesus Christ will be Lord. He will reign forever and ever. And it's coming again. I pray that when he comes, he'll find you in his kingdom in Jesus' name. Do you know Jesus is coming again? Revelation chapter 1. Revelation chapter 1. I'm looking at verse 7. Revelation chapter 1 verse 7. Behold, he cometh with the clouds. Isn't that what Daniel prophesied many, many years before John the Beloved? Behold, he comes. He cometh with the clouds. And every eye shall see him, and they also which pierced him, and all kindreds of the earth shall wail because of him. Even so, amen. The Lord is coming. I pray you'll be ready. Will you be ready? How will you be ready? Revelation chapter 2. Revelation chapter 2, verse 25. And that which ye have already... Hold fast till I come. That's how to be ready. Christ is coming. And as Christ is coming, he says, that which you have, the salvation you have, hold it fast. The sound doctrine which you have, hold it fast. The privilege and the opportunity of calling God your Father and Jesus your Savior and the Holy Ghost your Comforter, hold that fast. The confidence you have in the Lord, the faith you have in the Lord, hold that fast until I come. The privilege you have to belong to a church like this, teaching you sound doctrine, hold that fast till he comes. And when he comes, you'll not be found wanting in Jesus' name. Revelation chapter 22 Revelation chapter 22 I'm reading from verse 12 Behold, I come quickly And my reward is with me To give to every man According as his work shall be Verse 14 Blessed are they that do his commandments That they may have right to the tree of life And may enter in through the gates Into the city Verse 20 He, he will testify these things Save surely I come quickly Amen. Even so, come, Lord Jesus. The Lord is coming. I pray you'll be ready. Let's rise up and talk to the Lord in prayer. That as the Lord is coming, coming for his own, that you'll be ready, that you will not be lost for the people that will be lost. The Lord is calling upon you. If you have not repented, repent. Call upon the Lord. Judgment is coming. Judgment will come. And where will you be on that day when that judgment comes? Are you born again? Are you a child of God? Is your name written in the book of life? Have you received grace and godliness? 
living righteous and pure and holy. Because without holiness, no man shall see the Lord. Why don't you call upon the Lord on this day of opportunity? Don't waste your opportunity and don't waste your chance. Salvation is available. Righteousness is available. You can turn away from sin and turn to the Savior. Already the Lord has shown us there, the ancient of days, God the Father, the judge of the whole earth, the judge of the heathen, the judge of all people, the judge of the whole world. He will set his throne. And the books will be opened. The book of records. So that all the evil things men have done, all the evil things young people have done, all the evil things boys and girls have done, all the evil things youths and adults have done, and they have not repented, they will be read out to the hearing of everyone on the final day. But you can repent today. You can call upon the Lord today. You can have your sins forgiven. Your sins washed away. Your sins cleansed away. Your sins forgiven and forgotten today. And you can say, Lord, I come to you. I'm so sorry for the sins I've committed. Blot out the handwriting of ordinances that is against me. Blot out the remembrance of my sin. Blot out all my evil. Blot them out. Wash them away. I don't want to wait too long until the day of judgment. The mercy of God is available today. Those who reject the mercy of God will be waiting for the wrath of God. The love of God is available today. Those who reject the love of God will be waiting for the wrath, the indignation, the judgment, the fury, indignation, and judgment of the Almighty God. Grace is available today. Love available today. Mercy available today. Compassion available today. Salvation available today. Those who reject his salvation. They are getting ready for the suffering, eternal suffering, in the lake of fire forever and ever. But today you can call upon the Lord. Today you can ask for the mercy of the Lord. Today you can ask for the salvation of the Lord. And it will wash your sins away, will take your sins away. And the Spirit of God will bear witness with your heart that your sins are forgiven. New life has come unto you. You become a new creature in Christ. And the Spirit of God will do a regenerating work, a recreating work, a renewal in your life. You'll never be the same again. And then you'll have the grace to live a newness of life. Righteousness will come. Holiness will come. Godliness will come. You will hate the evil things you've done in the past. Then you will love obedience to the word of God. When that new life comes into you. It comes as we talk to the Lord. As we pray to the Lord. As we ask him, Lord, I want your grace. I want your strength. I want your ability. The divine ability and strength and help to live in newness of life. Salvation from sin. Righteousness. Following after the footsteps of Christ. Grace. Godliness. Holiness without which no man shall see the Lord. Then you will delight in righteousness. You reject. You abandon. You forsake. You throw away. The act of the Antichrist. You reject the spirit of the Antichrist. You reject the mouth and the language of the Antichrist. Because of the mouth of the Antichrist. 
because of the utterance of the Antichrist, because of the utterance, pronouncements, blasphemy of the Antichrist. That's why the wrath and the indignation and the fury and the judgment and the fire will come upon him. And those who have the spirit of the Antichrist, they will experience the eternal everlasting judgment of the Antichrist as well. Those who have the language, the speech, the mouth of the Antichrist, they will also have the same judgment, the same suffering of the Antichrist. Those who speak against God, against Christ, against the servants of Christ, against the saints of Christ, and they speak blasphemous words, and they say it in the pulpit, or they say it in the public, or they say it in the private. Those who have the mouth of the Antichrist will have the judgment and the wrath of God and the indignation that will come upon the Antichrist. Satan and his angels and his demons will be cast into the lake of fire. And all the people that forsake God, all nations that forsake God, all the people that have the mouth and the spirit and the life and the acts and the behavior of the Antichrist, did you? will experience for eternity the judgment coming upon the Antichrist. The Lord is coming. And he wants you to be ready. And we get ready by getting saved. Sinners are not ready. Repent and be ready. Backsliders are not ready. Repent, be restored and be ready. Those who are saying no to the commandment of God, they are not ready. Say yes to the Almighty God and be ready. Those who are resisting the voice of the Holy Ghost, those who are resisting the voice and the pleading of the Lamb of God, they are not ready. Submit yourself to Christ as Lord and King and be ready. Be ye also ready. But an hour ye think not the Son of Man cometh. Christ is coming. Only those who have repented are ready. Only those who are righteous are ready. Only those who are washed in the blood of the Lamb are ready. Only those who commit themselves to the Lord in righteousness and holiness. Only those people are ready. Only those who are walking prayerfully and carefully according to the word of the Lord. Only those are ready. Only those who yield themselves unreservedly unto the Lord. Only those are ready. And I saw as the Son of Man came with the clouds of heaven. And he came to the ancient of days. And he was brought before him. And dominion and power, majesty and glory was given unto the Son of Man. So that his dominion, his kingdom will be forever and ever. Christ shall reign. He says, behold, I come. I come quickly. My reward is with me. To give unto those who are following the Lord. According to their deeds, according to their works. Come to the Lord. Reconcile with the Lord. Bind your consecration upon the altar and say, Lord, I come to you. I give myself, I surrender myself completely unto you. And Lord, I will never go back again. Nothing will separate me from the love of Christ who died for me. Make your covenant with the Lord. Remain, abide in the Lord, and let his word abide in you. And have the grace to continue to serve the Lord in righteousness and holiness. Holding on to the truth, holding fast to watch of God until he comes. Until he comes. Until. 
it comes again. Those are the people that he will take home when he comes. Those who abide, those who remain, those who dwell in him. They resist temptation. At the time of persecution, they keep on standing. Standing firm in the Lord. Standing firm in the grace of the Lord. Remain steadfast, immovable, always abiding in the will of God and the work of God. Always abiding the life of righteousness and holiness. So that when he comes...